five. A whole bunch of people who are no friends of Farage at all who detest him saying this is wrong. Four. We were sort of enlisted to be foot soldiers and be compliant in lockdown and masks and vaccines at the behest of the government to fight this new enemy. Three. And yet Keir Starmer hasn't been able to bring himself to say, I think that Nigel Farage has a point here and he's been hard done by. The coot scandal exposes the sinister nature of the diversity, equity and inclusion industry. One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. Who are these people, Alison? Who are these people who think it's okay, a source of merit no less, to chuck a loyal customer out of a bank, someone whose only crime was to appeal to parts of the electorate who've long felt abandoned by our major parties? Who are these people who think they can breach the number one rule of banking, client confidentiality, and still remain in post, pulling down a five million quid annual salary for a company that only exists because after previous episodes of rank greed and stupidity, it was bailed out by taxpayers. Taxpayers, by the way, who still own 40% of the business. NatWest and its Coots subsidiary have become a case study in how not to manage both a bank and a public relations crisis. For some time, Alison Rose had no intention of resigning, and the NatWest board was determined to protect one of their own. NatWest held that position even after countless ministers, including the Prime Minister, made clear that closing down Nigel Farage's accounts because he backed Brexit and held other perfectly legal political views that Coots didn't like was, in Sunak's words, wrong. No one should be barred from using basic services for their political views, said Rishi Sunak. Free speech is the cornerstone of our democracy. On Tuesday, the NatWest board expressed full confidence in Alison Rose, but by Wednesday morning, after days of stonewalling, she did finally resign. Will the Coots CEO, the NatWest chairman and other board members responsible for tone-deaf statements now follow? Rose said diversity, inclusion and tackling climate change would be central pillars of her leadership of NatWest. She's part of a growing breed of corporate leaders engaging in virtue signalling on an industrial scale. Yet under her watch, Alison, NatWest, along with some other big banks, was called out by MPs for being very quick to increase costs for mortgage borrowers but much, much more hesitant to lift easy access savings rates out of the doldrums. When asked to appear before the Treasury Select Committee of MPs, Rose said she was too busy. She only (laughs) relented and agreed to face questions from MPs after being publicly arm-twisted by the committee chair and other banks had already agreed. And not only that, co-pilot, she's also brought the sacred Christian name, Alison, into disrepute. (laughs) She has. Although you, of course, distinguished co-pilot, have two L's. (laughs) For years, much of UK's big business boss class has emphasised their inclusive, diverse, remainy role model niceness, stressing the ESG, the environmental, social and governance merits of their actions. Meanwhile, banks are barely passing on interest rate rises to savers and our supermarkets and house builders are finally under investigation by the Competition and Markets Authority. They all, of course, deny wrongdoing. There's so much to discuss this week, not least last Thursday's triple by-election drama. But I'd say that those who think this coot saga is only about Nigel Farage haven't grasped what's really happened. What's your take, Alison? With two L's. (laughs) Why is that Alison Dame, Alison? What's going wrong, Halligan? What's going wrong? You got the wrong (laughs) Alison. Because we're the awkward squad. We don't get the titles, do we? We just do our jobs properly without behaving like the other Alison. As as you said, Liam, in your blistering introduction, I don't know who NatWest are paying to do their crisis management, but they're rubbish, aren't they? I mean, clearly the board were dragging their heels, hoping it would blow over after Dame Alison Rose made an apology to Nigel Farage, conceding she had made a serious error of judgment. No kidding. She gave a false account of a client's financial situation to the BBC. Coots was purging Nigel Farage because he didn't fit in with their student common room woke worldview. Well, I, I think Alison Rose is guilty of gross misconduct And she should not be getting some huge payoff, half funded by the British taxpayer, nor should she be allowed to leave by mutual agreement. We all know, Liam, don't we? If she'd been a 
junior banker. She'd have been through the swing doors as quickly as possible. So actually, it's interesting. I mean, I've had a fascinating week because I've been in touch with Coots bankers past and present. And just interestingly, one Swiss banker told me earlier today that in Switzerland, Alison Rose would be facing a prison sentence and would have a criminal record for the behavior that she's been indulging in. Now, we can dig down into this, Liam, but I have been hearing, as I said, from insiders at Coots and a recently departed, this is stuff that I haven't read anywhere, actually, and a recently departed Coots banker tells me he spent the weekend fielding calls from a lot of former clients who were ringing to ask him which bank they should move their funds to. Yeah. They are appalled by this fiasco that you'll love this. One highly influential Coots client said it was the main topic of conversation at the bar at White's private members club in St. James's. And this is a Halligan phrase. The chuntering over the pink gins is formidable, said the senior <laughs> Coots client. And they're all absolutely aghast, of course, by this dreadful breach of client confidentiality, not to mention the splashing of their exclusive private bank across the papers. Morale at Coots is rock bottom, I'm told. The staff can see the bonus pot being destroyed by this. The investment performance is piss poor. What's being offered is retail plus not a lot. And staff are agreed that this is Coots's Ratner's reference to the Gerald Ratner saying, admitting that Ratner's jewellery was rubbish or a Bud Light moment. Again, a reference to the recent instance where a very masculine American beer was given to a transgender knit to promote with predictably dreadful results. So Liam, I think what we're seeing is potentially a lot of Coots clients walking out of the door, a lot of NatWest clients possibly also. But here's a good comment from a current Coots banker, which I think takes the story on, as you say, this isn't just about their appalling treatment of Nigel Farage. And the banker says, to say that incredulity reigns here is an understatement. Wokery is clearly in charge and it has its claws in all aspects of our business. It's almost cult-like with all the training development, including woke. What I find sad is a 330-year-old business is being destroyed by such views which have no relevance to banking per se. How the existing management can't see the atrocious damage that's being done is baffling. Peter Flavel and Camilla Stowell, she's the head of client coverage. And he's the CEO. Of he's Coots. the CEO. We all think they should go, but they probably won't, certainly not voluntarily. So, yeah, just to sum up, as well as the immediate impacts we see there on Coots and that West shares sunk to the bottom of the FTSE 100 following the resignation of Alison Rose. And coming back, Liam, to your excellent introduction, how have EDI Equality, diversity, inclusion, ha ha, inclusion, everybody that you agree with, but not including people you dislike. How have these woke values infiltrated so many banks and businesses, allowing a liberal elite class to indulge their pet save the world hobbies at the taxpayers or the customers expense? While excluding the great unwashed, that's also what a yeah. lot of this is about. Hiding behind be kind, be nice, Absolutely. virtue signaling as a way of basically practicing social engineering and going back to some kind of Victorian society where the people who are sort of below the salt yeah. are excluded. Because this goes way beyond coots, of course, which clearly it trades on being a ridiculously elitist organization. That's what you're paying for. Mm. And if you want to pay for that, that's fine. It's a, it's a free country. But this goes way beyond Coots, of course. The person in all this that's really surprised me over recent days isn't Alison Rose, because frankly, she's only ever worked in that West. She's only ever worked in a sort of cocooned corporate environment. She's never been in politics. She's never sort of formed a business or employed people in her own right. She's basically been a corporate politician. Yeah. And that's fair enough. That's completely fine. She's had a stellar career, but she's made massive misjudgments along the way. I mentioned one just you know, refusing to appear in front of the Treasury Select Committee. Utterly mad. Yeah. I mean, who is advising her? Why can't she understand how ridiculous that is from a PR point of view? She's really lucky that story didn't quite get out of the business pages onto the front pages. But the person who's really surprised me in this is Howard Davis, yes. who is a very, very experienced sort of panjandrum 
nice person, the kind of person who the British establishment produces and then puts on a shelf and all the sort of nice jobs, all the baubles, all the public sector sinecures and the honorary degrees go to people, consensual feather smoothers like him. This bloke was the first chairman of the Financial Services Authority. And that was, you know, many years ago. He's chaired the UK Airports Commission. He's been a senior civil servant. He's got degrees coming out of his ears. He's done all kind of big corporate jobs He's a member of the governing body of the Royal Academy of Music. He's one of these people who just gets all these nice jobs because he has the right views and he's seen as toilet trained. And the UK establishment is absolutely terrible at this, at keeping tight um, the circle of people who get these kind of very powerful, very cosy, very well remunerated, very prestigious jobs. And so there's a little bit of diversion there's a little bit of diversity. There's a little bit of inclusion here and there for you know to decorate yeah. the plethora of people who rule over us. And of course, many of those people who are ticking diversity boxes absolutely deserve those jobs. I'm not saying that they don't, but they are still doing very little to change the cognitive diversity of many of our institutions. That is the major problem. I absolutely don't begrudge at all people who get wonderful jobs in the public sector or in the private sector who happen to be from diverse backgrounds, not for one second. But that should not be allowed to mask the fact that there's less cognitive diversity, Alison, as there's more gender and ethnic diversity in some of these institutions. How could Howard Davis possibly think that it was sustainable to say that Alison Rose has the full confidence of the board mm. when she's basically broken the first convention of banking and even the Tories who hate Nigel Farage with a passion. This guy has wound them up all his professional life. A conservative prime minister from the Commons dispatch box and countless other Tory front benchers saying, whatever we think of Nigel Farage, this is wrong. A whole bunch of people who are no friends of Farage at all who detest him saying this is wrong. Nigel actually told me that he thinks the Tories have played a blinder on this. He says the government's response to this has been superb, not least because he knows how much they hate him. And yet Keir Starmer hasn't been able to, even as we record on Wednesday afternoon, to bring himself to say, I think that Nigel Farage has a point here and he's been hard done by. I think you might be being a bit kind here. I mean, Alison Rose was celebrated as being, (laughs) I don't worry as a woman to Halligan, I can say things that you might not dare to. So Alison Rose was famously, you know, the first female chief executive of a UK bank and celebrated as such. But as you point out, she's a sort of Nat West careerist. She hasn't had broad experience and probably that's now been revealed in this absolutely dreadful and allegedly possibly illegal move against Nigel Farage. I'm sure it's not going to stop here. Nigel's going to be coming after the board of NatWest and I think he'll be wanting to bring about huge change in banks on on the back of this. But we can also think of another woman at the top of a British organisation, Amanda Pritchard, the incredibly useless head of NHS England. And she too, a sort of out of Oxford, straight into the NHS, no experience anywhere else and just absolutely dreadful at her job, a real sort of sinecure really. Now, I think that, as you said, Liam, We've seen the Tories actually, you know, taking a pretty strong stand. And I was very struck by Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, saying that the Coot scandal exposes the sinister nature of the diversity, equity and inclusion industry. And as you said, Liam, you know, something that seems nice and fluffy and unarguable is actually taken a sinister hold, I think, on so many of our institutions, even on apparently sensible places like banks and other financial institutions. And I heard from a fund manager, I just thought I'd read this out for listeners because I think it's very interesting. He says, I can tell you that EDI and ESG are completely locked in to our industry. Any opinion which is a challenge or an expression of a personal belief which is contrary to the mantra will result in immediate dismissal or being managed out. 
there is zero inclusion, quote unquote, for a view which is not part of the mantra, think China, Myanmar, North Korea. Diversity hires cannot be challenged no matter how terrible. There is no equity. Equity means balance and equality. And an incontestable ideology is dictatorship. And as for inclusion, it's like the modern Christian liturgy, which professes to be doors open to everyone. But if you don't like a very particular form of worship, the doors are shut. It's the same throughout the corporate world. Now, that sets alarm bells ringing, doesn't it, Copilot? It does. And how entitled must do you have to be to think that you can withdraw a fundamental service mm. to somebody? Banking is utility. Bankers should be, certainly high street bankers, should be plumbers rather than yes. architects. Yeah, They're about providing basic utility service. In other countries of the world, there is a universal service obligation that everybody is entitled to a bank account. And there's a much broader thing to this story. It's not just about the march of wokery through our institutions and the sort of ethnic cleansing of people who might have voted for Brexit who, or who might have views mm. that would seem a bit off around a posh dinner party in Chelsea or something, i.e. how most of the rest of the country thinks tens yeah. of millions of people. It's not just that. It's also the fact that banks are now rapidly withdrawing cash. They don't wants to deal with cash, is the cash handling charges. They want to be able to monitor every single transaction that we make. They can then sell that information to third parties for marketing purposes. And this is another major problem. As we move to a cashless society, and as we've been discussing, banks are withdrawing and from high streets. Many bank branches are closing down. How about the one and a half to two million people in the UK that currently don't have bank accounts because they can't get bank mm. accounts? Not because they're politically exposed, because banks just don't think that they're worth it. They don't think they're financially worth the candle. Now, take it from me. A banking license is a license to print money. And if the government is giving you a banking license, and by the way, they're not very good at giving banking license to so-called disruptor banks who are trying to challenge, frankly, the oligopoly of our very concentrated high street banking industry here in the UK. If the government gives you a banking license, that should come with that exorbitant privilege where you can just create credits and you can make huge amounts of money just by sitting there, by taking money off the Bank of England at a certain rate of interest and not passing on the rate rises to savers. That's what the banks have been doing. It's disgusting how they've been doing it. Frankly, ministers should have called that out months and months and months ago. If you are given that banking license, then you should have to adhere to a universal service obligation mm. where anybody who wants a bank account should be able to get a bank account. And as cash is withdrawn, that becomes increasingly important. How can you possibly shop online? How can you pay your utility bills if you haven't got a bank account? How can you shop in lots of shops that are increasingly saying, oh, we're being all nice. We're spending time making burgers so we don't have to handle cash. And then they don't have to take the cash handling charges either. This move away from cash, it's been completely undebated in the House of Commons. It hasn't appeared in any manifesto. It's happening massively. And this coots issue, if anyone thinks this is about Nigel Farage and elitism, it absolutely isn't. It is about that but it's about so much more. It's about the universal banking obligation and the shift away from cash, both of which leave a huge number, millions of people in this country, vulnerable, not least less well-off families, and in particular, the elderly. I can hear your anger, Liam, and it isn't just those people, although they're in a terrible position. People have been warning, haven't they, about this Chinese-style credit system. So it's easy to imagine a situation in which you know, the likes of us, awkward squad, we're not going to be affording you access to that line of credit because you've expressed disbelief that the wildfires in Greece are actually linked to climate change rather than being caused by people who want to burn down the trees so they can put up hotels. So it's possible to see, isn't it? And I have since COVID have zero trust for those in authority anyway. So the idea that the likes of Alison Rose will be sitting in judgment on us with her teenage Maoist views about what's right and wrong is really awful. I tell you, Liam, you know the thing in the 40-page dossier on Nigel that really made me laugh? They accused him of, are you ready for this? 
retweeting Ricky Gervais. No, that one. <laughs> holding Thatcherite values. <laughs> Now, let's try and have a think how many people who made money through the 80s and 90s and then went to banking with their success at Coots held dreadful Thatcherite values. I mean, what absolute arrant nonsense, isn't it? Whatever your politics, that is completely outrageous to disparage somebody for admiring a prime minister (laughs) who won three (laughs) successive general elections and was our first woman prime minister from a very much a lower middle class grammar school background. I mean, any objective historian would say that person had a massive impact on British public life. And for somebody to be penalised for for admiring them is just outrageous. More than the oat milk Alison Rose and her ilk. That's the cheek of it, isn't it? Is these people in their sinecures. I mean, this is what happens when you earn five million quid a year, right? Yeah. Without actually building a business, without putting your own capital at risk. Five million quid a year, along with a huge corporate infrastructure around you. You're not a business leader. You're basically a politician if you're doing something like running a big listed bank. And she has shown to have almost no grasp of big league grown-up politics. And people say, oh, she's badly advised, all the rest of it. The thing about being a leader is that when somebody says something that's complete rubbish, you say, sorry, I'm not going to do that. That's complete rubbish. And that's what she's done. To think that she could have held on. I mean, my God. As I say, who are these people? The trouble is, is they're massively influential and they are proselytising for values. And we can talk a bit about how net zero has taken a bit of a knock this week. But given that Nigel's clash with Coots does seem to be a bit of a watershed, we're talking about perhaps an emergency law being introduced to prevent banks cancelling account holders. What do you think, Liam, about rooting out this absolutely dreadful EDI from the corporate world where totally weak, feeble CEOs are just being bossed around by the human resources brigade. I don't know. I think it's horrifying. And the reason I think not just is it horrifying on an individual basis, I think it's horrifying because it's anti-business. These places, their job is to make money. and, And that's not a crass thing to do because they're making money so that we can have, we can afford the kind of society that's generous to the less well-off, isn't it? When you've got the bankers who don't think, and you've got Alison Rose assuming her incredibly posh £5 million a year job and says her mission is going to be climate change, you think, you know, have you thought about the accounts that you hold, love? Have you thought about delivering value for savers? I mean, they're living in cloud cuckoo land. I don't know. I just think it's really, really alarming. And I hope that this will spearhead reform and will make banks like that think twice about putting net zero before actual savings yields for real normal people? I'd like to think it's a bit of a watershed moment, Alison, but I kind of doubt it because these people, if you like, they've got such a stranglehold on our establishment now. And those of us who push against them, we are targeted and derided and pilloried and talked about behind our backs just because we're trying to stand up for how lots of ordinary people think. I'm astonished at how many journalists think like this, think like Alison Rose, think that this is just about Nigel Farage's ego, a failure to understand, a determination not to understand. Even now, you've got so-called leading journalists saying this is a storm in a teacup, This was all about money rather than his politics. Read the 40-page document before you express an opinion. But a lot of these people aren't. They're so determined to be right. They're so used to being right. They're so used to having their own way that I fear rather than a watershed, this will be a mere pinprick in the face of an emerging sort of cultural phenomenon of our time, which is this environmental, social governance agenda industrial scale virtue signaling used by extremely well-off, extremely privileged people to get their own way and to exclude other 
less fortunate just people. before we move on to the interview i think we should just mention that that, that the by-elections the tories were expected to lose all three but they clung on by their fingernails in uxbridge and south ryslip and that liam that was because of ules that was the ultra low emission zones that sadiq khan is imposing now on the outer london boroughs and and it was widely felt that the Tories had only avoided a huge defeat there as they had a massive defeat in Selby and Anstey and Summerton and Froome where as we predicted on Planet Normal thousands and thousands of Conservative voters refused to go and vote for the non-Conservative Conservative government but just to say that a backlash to net zero just felt like it was getting underway This week, we're seeing more and more nations now prioritizing economic growth and national interest over climate policy. And I think that we're going to see that tiny victory in Uxbridge may mark a turning point in the thinking of the government if it sees, if it starts to panic as we're approaching the general election next year. And we will start seeing some of those net zero targets moving away from petrol and diesel cars, totally unattainable by 2030. Watch this space. I think we're going to see quite a lot of quietly embarrassed rowing back. In March, the Daily Telegraph broke a story. The former Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has described the leaking of thousands of his WhatsApp messages. The Daily Telegraph says it's obtained thousands of WhatsApp messages. On the 100,000 leaked WhatsApp messages revealed. Some poor so-and-sos had to go through those. And now, those same poor so-and-sos are going deeper. The stunning incompetence of the British state was absolutely extraordinary. The Covid inquiry may be underway. They definitely knew what they were doing when they took them out of the hospitals into the care homes. But you shouldn't have to wait years for answers. You've got lockdown. There is no way that that isn't going to have a massive impact. If I had sit on that material to protect politicians' dark secrets, I don't think that would have been an honourable thing to do. The Lockdown Files podcast from The Telegraph. Follow now, wherever you're listening to this, to make sure you don't miss an episode. In a week when we've seen 24-7 news coverage of wildfires in Greece and what looked like telltale signs of deliberate fear-mongering over climate change, I thought it would be really helpful to hear from two leading experts on manipulation. Laura Dodsworth and Patrick Fagan have written an incredibly timely and fascinating book, Free Your Mind, The New World of Manipulation and How to Resist It. The book looks at how agendas are secretly pushed upon us through social media, advertising, and even the government's own behavioral psychologists. The book also offers readers tips on how to defend our minds against being taken in. Laura Dodsworth is, of course, a returnee to the rocket. Laura is well Ray. Laura is well known to Planet Normal listeners as the author of The Brilliant A State of Fear, her devastating analysis of how the British government set about scaring the pants off the British public during COVID. Her co-author, Patrick Fagan, is a behavioural scientist with 12 years experience of mind manipulation. Previously, the lead psychologist at Cambridge Analytica, Patrick is now a part-time lecturer and runs several data consultancies. Laura and Patrick claim that we are all at war in an information battlefield. So I began by asking them, what do you mean by an information battlefield? Well, we are bombarded with information constantly throughout the day. We receive the average, according to one statistic, of 174 newspapers worth of information every day. Everyone really is trying to manipulate us. It's constant. You can't really get away from it. Is there a specific enemy, Laura, or is this just endemic throughout society? Well, I think that your listeners, who are probably familiar with my last book, State of Fear, expected me to say the government. And yes, the government is one of the culprits, but really only one. I mean, the thing is, you you referred to the martial language. And I think everybody listening is going to remember that very wartime footing we were on in um, COVID during the lockdown. You know, we were sort of enlisted to be foot soldiers and be compliant in 
you know, lockdown and masks and vaccines at the behest of the government to fight this new enemy. And you can see it again now with climate. The language is very martial. In fact, some people have called for us to be on a wartime style footing in the fight against climate change. So, yes, the government and its nudge units is one of the enemies of our own free thinking and right thinking. But it's not just that, you know, everybody will relate to the fact that your phone dings first thing in the morning and instantly you're there on social media, which is designed to be addictive and a time thief. All the news, the advertising, influence and manipulation are completely inherent to human nature. You can't avoid it completely. And in a way, nor should you. You know, when we try and teach our children to read, we're trying to influence them. But we are at a very unique time where there is a confluence of government nudge units, AI, big tech and increasingly sophisticated psychology and nudging techniques. Can you each give us an example of how people are being manipulated without knowing it. Patrick, is there something that when you were writing the book that you thought, gosh, that's that's really interesting? Well, let's say, for example, you go to buy a holiday on the website and you look at the web page and it says that 10 people have viewed this hotel today. And then it says there's only one room left at this price um, and you can book it now and then pay when you get there. That's using a whole litany uh, of nudges to get you to to buy essentially so there's so many examples like that i could give another one in the news recently is sadiq khan's mate campaign i'm not sure if you've seen that but it was designed by behavioral scientists and it uses a number of behavioral science techniques such as social norms to make a certain behavior seem unacceptable like drink driving uh, it uses efficacy by giving men a very simple easy thing they can do which is say mate uh, when they see a uh, certain behavior. And it also uh, kind of uses techniques that animal behaviorists use. So it uses an elongated vowel in mate and then the t at the end to grab attention and make it seem serious. And the behavioral scientists who designed it have said it was designed that way. So it's a bit like dog trainer telling a dog to sit. So that's an example as well. Laura, I was interested in this idea of sort of incremental way of getting us to think that something unpalatable is gradually more more palatable. And one of the examples you give in the book is uh, getting us used to the idea that we might start eating insects. <laughs> insects, exactly. That's a really good example because there is no great clamour in this country for people to start eating insects. Our cultural norms are roast chicken, not crickets. But Yet, there does seem to be this quite weird top-down insistence that we should eat insects. And it comes from supranational organisations, public health wonks and celebrities. And the way they do it is with a foot-in-the-door technique, or rather, when it comes to insects, it's more of a mandible-in-the-door technique. So they do that by using celebrities. That's what's called the messenger effect, because we look up to certain people and we are more likely to follow advice if it comes from people we respect and, and like. But also it's sort of snuck into food gradually. You know, there's been talk of bakers putting something like 4% cricket flour into bread. This happened in, in Finland. Then you look at a loaf of bread, it looks completely normal. And you think, okay, sure, I'll, I'll give that a try. You try, it's not so bad. And you're ready to progress to the next step. Before you know it, it'll be 50% cricket flour. And then before you know it, you'll be buying a bag of crickets, not bread. So if they start with the big ask where they really want you to be, you're more likely to say no. Whereas if they follow a foot in the door technique of giving you one little step after another, they lead you more gently to the desired results. We saw it, when, for instance, with um, vaccine passports. First of all, we had Nadim Zahawi denying that there was any plan to introduce vaccine passports. But this is while the government had itself put out a number of contracts for people to develop back-end solutions for vaccine passports. So while they're saying no, just the denial itself seeds the idea into your mind. And then it comes in gradually. Oh, it's just for nightclubs, for young people, those, those naughty young people who are out having fun drinking and snogging each other. And that's a foot in the door in itself. And had there not been a a very large resistance mounted by the British public. For all we know, we'd have vaccine passports now for not just getting onto planes, but for going into supermarkets. But watching the hysterical reporting of the hot weather in Southern Europe, with all its living nightmare scenes from Dante's Inferno, are we seeing 
the nudge unit again, potentially nudging us towards compliance with net zero? I think it's undoubted that the behavioural scientists have their hand in this. And in fact, one government insider told me there was literally skipping through the corridors of Whitehall when people realised how successful their fear and nudging campaigns during COVID had been. I, I was alerted to the fact that the techniques would switch from COVID to climate by one of the scientists, the social scientists on SPY B, that's the Scientific Pandemic Influence Group for Behaviours. I asked him, after having frightened the British public into compliance, what the plan was to de-escalate fear. And he told me there wasn't a plan to de-escalate fear. Why would they do that? Because we were going to move from COVID to climate crisis. And we've heard this a number of times through different politicians, behavioural scientists and academics. This really has literally been seen as, in quotes, a malleable window where our habits can be changed. And so when you see weather maps becoming increasingly lurid with colours that are supposed to shout danger, and when you get notifications on your GPS warning you about heat or floods, and when you see climate being pushed to be the lead story every single day, even though when we look out of our windows, we see nothing but grey and rain, it is part of a deliberate campaign, I'd wager, to make you frightened, to make it top of mind, and ultimately to soften you up for policies which are supposed to encourage you to decarbonise your lifestyle. Patrick and Laura, both of you, does the UK deserve an apology from the Nudge Unit? And, And should we have statutory monitoring of the use of psychological techniques on the public? Well, I don't suspect an apology will be forthcoming for various reasons of course not least of which is um cognitive dissonance essentially people have all sorts of defense mechanisms uh, i don't think people who have perpetrated this uh would be able to accept that they've done something wrong so i wouldn't expect an apology anytime soon but i do agree that there needs to be some kind of oversight or or people need to be held to account over the use of behavioral science not so much in a commercial point of view not least because that's what i do for a living but more from a government point of view because i think when you know if coca-cola wants to sell more coca-cola there's kind of a transparency in that selfishness and whereas with the government if they have a moral crusade and they believe it's their duty to make everyone comply with something, I think that's when it can get very dangerous. So absolutely, uh, an overview of how these techniques are used, making sure that people can opt out if they want to, just like you would in a psychology experiment at university, giving people informed consent. I think that's all very important. Laura, Simon Ruder, one of the founders of the Behavioural Insights Unit, did write a mea culpa about the nudge tactics during COVID. And he said that one of the most egregious, far-reaching mistakes was the level of fear willingly conveyed on the public initially to boost compliance with the rules. But then he says later, driving policy decisions themselves. Were you shocked to see the public being used as guinea pigs in this extraordinary, what amounted to a mass experiment? Well, my shock at the British public being frightened, nudged, manipulated and coerced was really my epiphany during COVID. And for me, free your mind is the answer to it. A state of fear was very much a this is the state we're in book. This is what the government thinks is okay to do to people, supposedly in our best interests. And I think, unfortunately, there is no apology coming from a nudge unit of having frightened the population. The spy bee scientists aren't sorry about what they've done. I think there is some kind of division among those social scientists. That's why you see Simon Ruder in Unheard apologise. But just a couple of weeks ago, David Halpern in an interview saying that the use of fear is justified if people are wrongly calibrated. We're not even seen on the same level as Pavlov's dogs salivating when a bell rings. We're seen like pieces of machinery. You don't talk about calibrating human beings. You talk about calibrating bits of machinery. So I think the answer is, although, you know, it's it's a nice idea to think there'd be a statutory body, some ethical oversight. I don't think it's coming. There's no government white knight. And people have to take responsibility themselves for filtering information, for knowing how to be an individual and control what goes into their mind and resist manipulation. That's what the book is about. It's a field manual for the individual, because no one's coming to save you. Could I add, there was a rather shocking admission from David Halpern a few months ago, I think, that he 
designed a briefing deck for the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, that used nudges on him, on the Prime Minister, that used social proof by saying, all these other world leaders are doing this too, so you should as well, or you'll be left out. Um, and so at the very highest levels of power, these nudges are being used by unelected, unaccountable people to influence policy. So I, I really do think it needs to be held to account, yes. Now, you did ask a magician how people can avoid being deceived by magic. And he said, don't go to the show, which I thought was a great answer. Most of us, sadly, don't have the option of not watching the news, certainly not in my line of work, of not being on social media. Like a lot of people, I'm a bit of a Twitter addict. I do notice that my concentration span for other kinds of reading has dropped drastically. It's very hard to protect yourself from brainwashing by opting out. Do you both think that we have to walk away from these things or are there ways of dealing with it when you're interacting? Well, I would say three things. One is you can kind of nudge yourself. You can nudge yourself with the foot in the door technique. And it doesn't have to be that you stop watching the news or television or Hollywood completely, but you can just gradually kind of lessen your exposure and also expose yourself to it mindfully. So don't, for example, do it when you're tired or hungry or stressed because you're more psychologically vulnerable. Secondly, you can also choose the medium through which you consume it. And text is a lot better than image and especially video because it bombards us emotionally and we don't have the time to reflect and digest on it. So just reading a newspaper every weekend rather than, for example, looking at TikTok feeds uh, all day, every day about the news. And then thirdly is if you can recognize the techniques that are being used, as Laura said, you do have a certain level of immunity to it. Laura, there is evidence that the trans cult, or that's how I would refer to it, the alarming rise in young girls wanting to become boys or thinking they're born in the wrong body and maiming their own female body, that it was seeded on websites, apparently childish and harmless social media. Are you worried particularly about the susceptibility of the young who live on their phones to these uh, dangerous ideas. You said in the book that Patrick's wife has the security code to his smartphone to limit the time he spends on social media. I think I need that to happen to me. Laura, what about the impact on children who, who don't have awareness of these techniques? First of all, Patrick and I are not paragons of virtue. We're both social media addicts too. Patrick's wife has the security code to his phone and I have to give myself regular detox breaks because it's affected my concentration. I mean, first of all, if you are forewarned about the techniques, it helps you. So I find if I'm on an online booking website, there are there are various tactics I won't fall for. If it says 26 people are looking at this now, it doesn't make me rush to buy the dress or only one left. It doesn't make me rush to buy the shoes. I'm much more circumspect now because I recognise that they are online choice architecture techniques to manipulate me. It is much harder for young people to learn how to resist these techniques. I think there's probably a case for more state regulation, you know, to keep children safe online. But I will say, though, that young people have always been susceptible to different kinds of influences in their teenagers. One thing we point out in the book is that at times of big life events, such as going to university, that's also when you are more susceptible to being manipulated because everything in your world turns upside down. There are particular times of life it's important to watch out for young people, perhaps when they're at home in lockdown on their phones all the time, when young people go to university, for instance. Now, you say fascinatingly in the book that being clever is no defence against being brainwashed. In fact, it seems that the bigger the brain, the more likely people are to be divorced from reality or, or I suppose to lack common sense. Do you think that's what happened during COVID? You had an awful lot of apparently very intelligent people joining in with very, very dumb things. Patrick, is, that, is, 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 there, some, is there some sense in that? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people got bamboozled by following the science, as it were. You know, being intellectual, being educated, these may not actually be defences against this kind of manipulation, partly because really we're driven by our emotions more than anything else. But intellectual people can rationalise their choices better and come up with better excuses for doing what they're doing. And they also, because they're smart, they tend to believe that they're right and they're a bit less humble. 
You have a wonderful quote in the book from Thomas Jefferson, enlighten the people generally and tyranny and impression of body and mind will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of the day. Now, I do think free your mind is definitely going to help to enlighten the people and banish the evil spirits. I found it absolutely riveting. And I probably the only person alive who's read it, apart from you two, who's read it twice. (laughs) So I absolutely highly recommend it to Planet Normal listeners to give to everybody they know who needs to build up their resistance against all this madness that we are being bombarded with. I'd like to say something that chimes in on that Jefferson quote, which is really lovely, Alison. And that's The problem is that these days our biases are exploited against us mercilessly like never before. So social proof, scarcity, authority biases, fears, they're used to manipulate us into doing all kinds of things, buying brand A over buying brand B or falling in with unpopular government policies, whatever it is. But the great hope lies within because people will always find ingenious solutions. People do gravitate towards truth and everybody wants to be an individual. Nobody wants to be manipulated. So we need to come back to the optimism and and the belief that the human brain is wonderful and it should be free. The answer is always with us. Laura Dozzles and Patrick Fagan, thank you so much and thank you for writing such a tremendous book, Free Your Mind, The New World of Manipulation and How to Resist It, available on Amazon, but only only in a very limited number, low number of books. That's called scarcity, Nudge. Thank you. Thank you both. Well done, Alison. I thought that was a riveting interview. Free Your Mind by Laura Dodgeworth and Patrick Fagan is out now. It's published by Harper Collins. I must say, I think Laura in particular is a really important writer of our time. Yeah. I think that her original book, State of Fear, which we promoted on Planet Normal, has been thoroughly vindicated and more so by the lockdown files, by all the WhatsApp messages that were released shows just how right Laura was. A book that was pilloried in some quarters when it came out has been completely vindicated. I also wanted to mention, Alison, before we move on to emails, our Telegraph colleagues who have produced The Lockdown Files, a documentary podcast that really focuses in on the WhatsApp messages, which, of course, Isabel Oakshot made available to The Telegraph, Claire Newell and her investigations team, and indeed the fabulous... Louisa Wells, now our head of podcast, who did so much to get Planet Normal off the ground. Mm. They've done a really, really good job. I can't recommend highly enough the Lockdown Files podcast. And it also features an interview with, amongst others, Alison David Halpin of the Nudge Unit. It's really interesting to hear him Mm. attempting to justify the work uh, that he did during lockdown. Good journalism, and I'm proud that The Telegraph are doing it. I should say I was absolutely appalled by that David Halpern interview, not because it wasn't a good interview, but because he was so arrogantly unrepentant about what they'd done to people and seeing us all, Liam, as primed for the next pandemic when we could jump to it and do everything they told us to do, even though it was a disaster the last time we did it. Just quickly before we go on to emails, I should say that Free Your Mind has made me hyper aware of how we are being manipulated by the news, particularly in the last week. I'd really recommend it to listeners for maybe young adults, teenage children, because I think it's really the kids are bombarded spending all their time on social media. And I think to get them thinking about what are these people doing to us? Or was it Jeremy Paxman who said, why is this lying bastard lying to me? (laughs) To, To sum it up. Now on to our listener emails. Your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming, but make sure you address them to Alison Pearson and not any other errant Alison. <laughs> <laughs> if you put Dame Alison Pearson, you'll have a stronger chance of getting it read out, I tell you. <laughs> Here on the subject of the slightly comic climate alarmism, some of Planet Normal listeners have been moved to a bit of hyperbole. Tim says, I was speaking to a Greek colleague who had just returned from one of the Greek islands. She made two observations on the current wildfires. This is not news in Greece. Wildfires are common, always have been, always will be. I lived on Corfu in 1992. We fled from our villa because of extensive bushfires. 
The reason it has suddenly become newsworthy is because journalists are continually looking for evidence for man-made global warming. The bushfires are also more newsworthy because of the proliferation of hotels which have been built in the last 20 years, which are, of course, affected by the fires as they have been built where the brush used to be. Many of these fires are deliberately set, says Tim. While there are some nut jobs that do it for fun, there's an increasing suspicion that if someone wants to build a hotel in a certain location but are not allowed to, the best thing to do is to arrange for the trees to disappear via a carefully orchestrated bushfire. After the smoke has cleared, permission to build is then granted. The same method can be used to obtain permission for unpopular onshore wind turbines, all in the name of the climate emergency. Well, 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 Tim, who would have guessed that? And here's a lovely email from Lee. Dear Planet Normal, I write to share our recent experience in Greece, incredulous that we survived given what may have transpired. Our benevolent BBC and their insightful weather forecasts pre-warned us in graphic detail of the horrors we faced, particularly the BBC climate editor, a true hero who subsequently endured the horrors of Alicante at enormous personal risk in order to demonstrate the potential extent of the plight of those who might be affected by climate change. As a former beaver scout, says Lee, I was determined to be prepared, spending many hours scouring Temu before ordering fire retardant Barbie and Ken beach towels for dowsing the infernos we would inevitably confront. Our apprehension grew to fever pitch. Even before the journey commenced, terrified at exceeding our baggage allowance due to the weight of Snoopy shorts, smiley face bikinis, firefighting equipment, high vis fire resistant clothing, and headgear, and emergency burns dressings, etc. Imagine our surprise at the provision of transfer vehicles by our tour operator, specifically adapted with integrated life support systems filtering out the intense temperatures. Our hotel was also equipped with similar support systems throughout the building. We were astounded by the ingenious provision of an extensive external water-based cooling system in which we could immerse ourselves when our body temperatures rose unbearably. We survived on fish provided by the hotel, presumably boiled alive in the Aegean Sea. (laughs) Furthermore, we were extremely grateful for the availability of anxiety-relieving fluids throughout our ordeal. Paradoxically, whilst functional, the liquid transformed what could have been a distressing experience into a high Highly pleasurable one, especially when copious amounts were consumed in the company of others suffering the same climate change ordeal. Who knew? Please keep up the great work. Kind regards, Lee. That's what we like to see, Lee. A bit of hitting back at the alarmist Justin Rowlatt climate change narrative. A bit of a shift of gear, Alison, about the NHS. This one's from Naomi. Dear Planet Normal, writes Naomi. I'm writing about a recent encounter with A&E and how disappointed I was with my treatment, not by the doctors, nurses and carers, but with the system. I woke up one morning in an enormous amount of pain in my side and lower abdomen. Something really wasn't right, so I rang for an ambulance. After answering a few questions, I was told my condition wasn't life-threatening and I'd have to wait for up to an hour for a call back. I couldn't wait that long with paracetamol and ibuprofen, doing nothing to ease the pain and asked a kindly neighbour to take me to A&E. Upon arrival, I was met with a you shall not pass Gandalf the Grey type character. I could barely walk, was doubled over in pain, still in my pyjamas and clearly suffering. Still, Gandalf blocked my entrance, asked if I'd called 911. I replied, no, actually, I dialed 999. I was coldly directed towards an electronic survey. I recognised the questions. They were the same set as the 999 call and the computer said, no, you're not coming in. The pain was building even more, and at this point I collapsed into a ball on the floor, rapidly breathing and unable to muster the energy to stand. A nurse on the way in stopped me to ask if I was okay and how I was getting on with the survey. I replied, it's not letting me in. Ignoring the no from the computer, the nurse cast Gandalf aside and got me through the door. I'd like to say it was better from this point on, but alas, there was a long wait to be seen. By the time I was fully admitted, the pain was so severe it could be likened to labour pain. I was howling in agony, vomiting and passing out. Finally, I was moved to a small room and administered two doses of morphine and some other stuff. Once I'd stopped howling and vomiting, I was moved to corridor position six. After a CT scan, I was diagnosed with a burst ovarian 
cyst. Oh, Within minutes, I was being shoved full of antibiotics, whisked off to emergency surgery. Post-surgery, the full diagnosis, the cysts had twisted my ovary, cutting off the blood supply and killing it, hence the pain. All that had to be removed. Due to an utterly, utterly ridiculous bureaucratic system, says Naomi, I'd gone from a case that wasn't allowed through the door mm -hmm. to being rushed through to emergency surgery. Evidently, there are symptoms a human can see that a poorly designed survey can't. I'm now telling all my friends to cheat the survey to gain entry past the inhumane system. It's only when the humans take over and you can and can see you in real life that you will get proper care and a proper diagnosis. With the exception of Gandalf, the people I saw were brilliant. Sorry for the long email. I know it won't change anything, but I had to download my experience to people that would understand my hatred for the layers of bureaucracy that need to be broken down before you're allowed entry to an NHS that we all contribute to. Also, as a warning to other women to not accept no as an answer and push your way in when you know something isn't right. Free at the point of use is great. The problem is you can't actually gain entry. My husband and I are jams, that is, just about managing the squeeze middle. We live an okay but not an affluent lifestyle by any means. Even so, we've taken the decision now to take out private healthcare insurance to get away from all the red tape and the you shall not pass attitude of the broken NHS. Though in emergencies, you have to put your life in the hands of those Gandalfs. I love listening to your show. Please keep up the good work. Warmest regards, Naomi. P.S. says Naomi, the NHS does not need diversity managers on big salaries. It needs better paid doctors and nurses and more beds. Brilliant email. Yeah, I'm so sorry, Naomi. I mean, ovarian cyst is incredibly serious, Liam. You can't just self-diagnose it on some stupid form. And I speak actually, uh, just to say it was my birthday weekend. I spent quite a few hours trying to source cancer scans for a couple of listeners and readers. The fact that people like me are having to try and help people play the system. And, and as Naomi recommends, Liam, you actually have to be cynical and just now say to people, you can't gain access just by being honest and straightforward. You really do have to play the system. Here's a lovely email from Dave. We've got some cracking ones this week. And Dave calls himself the window cleaning prophet. Good morning, Alison Liam. I've urged myself to write an email for over two years. So how, how do I keep this short and to the point? Simple. The Tories can win by the slimmest of majorities if they abandon net zero by 2050 and all the cobbled together chaos that it would involve. I'm a window cleaner of 15 years in a safe Tory heartland. Been a country lad all my life. Telegraph reading, specky subscribing, GB News fan. I'm waiting the inevitable Dear John letter from my bank for such <laughs> insolence. <laughs> Brace yourself, Dave. We're all getting those. I assure you, though, that the huge unspoken majority that made Brexit such a shock to this establishment are waiting to nail their colours firmly to the mast of any political party that will listen to them on net zero. Traders like me, small shopkeepers, publicans, cabbies, etc., do not spend their lives on Twitter. But boy, we are good political weather forecasters. I've always loved Thursdays anyway. Thanks, Planet Normal. Hope to see you at the next live event. Cheers, Dave. Well, Dave, we are, aren't we? We're hoping, Liam, aren't we, to, to have another lovely meeting of Planet Normal clan in the autumn. In the autumn. And if you'd like that to happen, do email us and let us know. It will help us to make it a reality. And on that bombshell, that's it from Planet Normal for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reasoned views. Email of the week. It's my turn. It's Naomi all the way. Yeah. Fantastic email, Naomi. And brilliant that you got your medical issues resolved. If you enjoy Planet Normal, please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps others to find the podcast and it really don't half cheer the pair of us up. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers Isabel Bouchard, Elliot Lampett, Cass Ho and Louisa Wells. Stay safe and stay in touch with us and with each other. And Planet Normal is now going on its summer break. We're going to be sunning our buns in various parts <laughs> of the UK. <laughs> we will be back on the 31st of August, if you can bear it. Between now and then, we're not leaving you in the lurch. We will be releasing some special 
archived versions of Planet Normal. So keep listening every Thursday. Keep the emails coming in. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. I'm off to the heat storm in Turkey. I'll report back in case I'm a charred heap of ash by the time I get back. Anyway, and it's goodbye from him. (laughs) 